There is no subject of greater importance to the sincere Christian than that of growing in Christ. He has no more vital concern than such heart-searching questions of, am I growing? Have I been growing in the past? Am I growing now? Am I properly maturing in my Christian faith? Am I becoming more and more of what God and Christ would really like to have me be? And yet in spite of that, most Christians are not growing. Don't you know that our assemblies are filled with half-hearted, uncommitted Christians who attend mostly out of a sense of duty and who seldom find any real joy in Christian service? One of the greatest threats to the future of the church and also to our personal security in Christ is found by those Christians who have not grown properly, who have not developed into the likeness of Jesus in their daily lives. And we need to have a vital concern because of that. We need to be concerned about our personal growth. We need to be concerned about the growth of the Lord's church. Because unless we find a solution to this far-reaching problem, heaven will not be our home. Unless the problem is solved, the potential for the church in the 21st century has been greatly diminished. And thus, while we might look upon this as being a very simple, a very commonplace topic in the very beginning, it strikes at the very heart of one of the greatest problems that we face within the church today. And thus, will you open your heart as we investigate it together? Now is the time to get back to the basics. Now is the time to put aside our exalted phraseology, our titillating, entertaining speeches, and become seriously concerned with why we're not what we really need to be. Now is the time for down-to-earth common sense as to the things that are necessary for a proper growth. The ingredients are not a mystery. You do not have to know Latin, Hebrew, or Greek in order to be able to understand them. Here they are in a nutshell. You eat the right kind of food. You participate in proper exercise. You stay away from those things that will make you sick. If you do these three things, you are going to grow. And yet, the rules are very simple. But the problem is application. And the application will become a test of our honesty, both with God and with ourselves. It will demand a willingness to change, to become more committed, to realize that where we are is far from where God would have us to be, and then to begin our journey toward that place. Let us begin on a solid biblical basis. What does the Bible say in regard to growth? Is it really as tremendously important as I've already expressed it as being? Listen to these passages in Ephesians 4, verses 14 and 15, that you henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, that you may grow up into him who is the head of all things, even Christ. In Hebrews 6 and verse 1, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. In Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22, Now you are therefore no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom you also are built up for a habitation of God by the Spirit. But not only must the church grow, but we also are to grow as individuals. And one is almost utterly impossible without the other because it is one of the most fundamental rules of life that all living things grow. When the growth process stops, then life begins to wane. 
And the Bible emphasizes the fact that it is as living stones that we're to find our proper place within the church. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, you also as lively stones a build up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, when we become a Christian, you have the seed of the Word of God planted in your heart, and then we must grow by adding to our character to the Christian graces, by developing a Christ-like personality, by going on toward the maturity that's found in Jesus Christ our Lord. In 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, But we all with unveiled face, behold, as yes, in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are transformed into the same image from glory into glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. If we're going to be a follower of Jesus, then we must grow as he grew. In Luke 2 and verse 40, the child grew and waxed strong, filled with, with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And a little later, in verse 52, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, in favor with God and man. It is no wonder then that when the apostle Peter gave his final admonition, that he laid the responsibility squarely upon each one of us and said in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now notice then these three important things concerning spiritual growth. First, it is natural in all the realm of living organism. It is the expected thing. Anything to the contrary is always a reason and a cause of concern. Strange, strange to say, however, that while a failure to grow and a lack of growth uh, is uncommon in the physical realm, it is seen everywhere in the spiritual. And yet it is not the will or the plan of God that it should be so. But in the second place, we find that there is no anticlimax in spiritual growth. Plants grow and mature and then wither and die. Young people grow into manhood or womanhood and then lose strength until death comes. But in the spiritual realm, the Christian can simply go onward and upward without any decline in spiritual growth. Now, it does not always happen that way to be sure, but the potential is there. I still like the story of the man before the firing squad who was finally asked if he wanted a final cigarette. And his reply was, no, thank you. I'm trying to quit. And you know, as laughable as that is, I honestly believe we ought to die trying to get better. As Paul said in Philippians 4, verses 14 and 15, not that I count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forth to those things that are before, I press on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But again, we find that spiritual growth is not optional. We've made a mistake if we believe that it is because Peter plainly declares in 1 Peter 2 and verse 2 that it is unto salvation. And perhaps this is a part of the reason that we're admonished in 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. Wherefore, the brethren, giving all diligence to make your calling in your election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be administered unto you abundantly into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But now, let's notice some of the ingredients that are necessary to spiritual growth. Because just as some things are necessary if you're going to grow physically, even so there are ingredients that are necessary to spiritual growth as well. And first of all, there are some things that must be put away. There are some unnecessary baggage that you cannot carry on this journey 
toward becoming a full-grown, mature person in Christ. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, and hypocrisy, and all evil speaking. In Colossians 3, verses 8 and 9, seeing that you put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filth of communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man and his deeds. And thus, no Christ-like character is possible so long as these things remain in our lives. Putting them away is a necessary part of spiritual growth. And so a diligent effort to put away, to rid ourselves of all those ugly habits that we formed prior to the time that we became a Christian is vitally important. These things are not compatible with spiritual growth, and so they must be put away. But right on the other hand, some things must be put on as well. Jesus tells the story in Matthew 13, verses 43 through 45 to warn of the great danger of simply putting evil out of our lives without replacing it with good. He says that evil will always come back to fill that void. And so when you put off evil, when you put off sin as a sword and filthy garment, he goes on to say in Colossians 3 verses 12 and 13, that you put on therefore is that elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, gentleness, long-suffering. He said that having put on therefore the new mind. And so there is something to be put off. There is something that is to be put on. In 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, he said, Be ye holy as I am holy. One of the choruses that I dearly love to hear the, the Jamaican Christian sing is one entitled Great Change, which has these lines, Some things I used to do, and I will do them no more. Some things I used to say, and I will say them no more. Some places I used to go, and I will go there no more. Some friends I used to keep, and I will keep them no more. It's been a great change since I was born. And that's merely the practical application of those things that we are to put off and those things that we are to put on in becoming God's kind of person. But also spiritual change and spiritual growth requires time for it to take place. Now don't misunderstand. Our death to sin is not to be gradual. This is a vital part of simply the new birth and of true repentance. And so we're not allowed time to grow gradually out of the practice of sinful conduct. For in Romans 6 and verse 2, God forbid, how shall we who are dead to sin living no longer therein. And so you must die to sin at the very time that you become a Christian. But it does take time to reach spiritual maturity. For in Hebrews 5 and verse 12, when by reason of time you ought to be teachers, and we must allow that time for ourselves and for others. But again, spiritual growth requires persistence and endurance. This is a marathon run. This is a lifetime proposition. For in Matthew 24 and verse 13, he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Revelation 2 and verse 10, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, moreover, my, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so, to keep on loving Christ supremely requires constant and persistent effort. The battle is not won. 
until it is over. The prize is not awarded until the end of the race. For in Romans 2 and verse 7, to those who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Hebrews 3 and verse 6 says, Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the beginning of the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. In Galatians 6 and verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for we shall reap in due season if we faint not. Oh, there's wonderful blessings to those who persist, to those who endure, to those who keep on growing. But in our struggle for Christian growth, first of all, we must eat the right kind of food. And this more than anything else is simply the word of God. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Or in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In James 1 and 21, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. And I believe that Jesus was referring primarily to the Old Testament when he said in John 5 and verse 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And then one of the grandest compliments ever paid to Christians in the first century is when Paul referred to the Bereans and said in Acts 17 and verse 11, these were more noble than those of Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things be so. But in spite of such precious food before us, We live on a starvation diet. We feed on such worldly price. And then we think that somehow, almost miraculously, we're going to become spiritually strong. We dip into every garbage can we pass. And then we wonder why we're spiritually sick. As an example, our assemblies are primarily feeding opportunities. But when we neglect or forsake these assemblies, then we neglect our opportunities of being fed. And furthermore, when we do come, we must have waited our appetite in advance. Uh, Do you remember how Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 6, uh, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, uh, for they shall be filled. Uh, In Psalms 42 and verse 2, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. It is no wonder that many do not enjoy our assemblies if they do not come hungry for spiritual things. Uh, There was the time that we were well known in the churches of Christ for our knowledge of the scriptures. But now, if anything, we're becoming notorious because of our ignorance, Uh, even when we encourage Bible reading among our own people. There is the danger that we'll make them into nothing more than spiritual robots that go through a ritual of reading chapters and never thinking about their real meaning. William Barclay gave a penetrating analysis when he said it is possible to read the scriptures meticulously, to know the Bible inside and out, from cover to cover, to be able to quote it verbatim, to pass any examination on it and still completely miss its real meaning. You know, we almost hear God say, as he did in Hosea 4 and verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because there is rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Thou shalt be no priest unto me because you have forgotten the law of thy God. 
I will also forget thy children. That, as an example of what I have in mind, on a recent trip to Jamaica in one congregation, uh, the, their youngest class uh, stood in the assembly to quote the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 5. Uh, and their young people had just completed an assignment uh, of memorizing the first three chapters of the book of Hebrews. Uh, while here in America, our young people stumble over one verse of memory word and then try to make a joke out of it at the time that they do it. That we have not instilled in them a love of that precious word. That how far we've fallen short of the words of the psalmist when he said in Psalms 1 and verse 2, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law doth he meditate both day and night. In Psalms 119 and verse 97, Oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. Is it not obvious that if we're ever going to become strong in Christ, that we must again become hungry for the Word of God, and we must feed upon it in unending delight. But in the second place, if you're going to develop spiritual strength, you must exercise yourself properly. Oh, how vitally important it is, and yet how derelict we are in regard to it. Many who consider themselves to be strong eat and eat and eat, but never work meaningfully for Jesus. But do you realize that eating good without proper exercise, has never made anyone strong. God, nothing ought to be more obvious to any one of us than that living for Jesus demands activity on our part. In Ephesians 4 and verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. In Galatians 6 and verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, and especially unto them that are of the household of faith. James 1 and verse 27, pure religion, and undefiled before God the Father is this, that you visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and keep oneself unspotted from the world, Jesus is our example in work. When he said in John 9 and verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. In fact, one of the grandest descriptions ever given of the life and the ministry of Jesus is a very brief statement in Acts 10 and verse 38 which simply says who went about doing good. If we're going to follow Jesus, we cannot be lazy or indifferent to the opportunities that are before us. What then is to be the real focus of our lives? In Hebrews 2 and verse 1, Wherefore, seeing that we're compassed about, by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. Or in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we are his workmanship created unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. But now here is a lesson that we've never learned very well in the church, and that is you can attend every possible assembly and not even come close to fulfilling the real purpose of the church being in the world because our primary purpose is not for worship, but it is for work. It is for activity. It is to lead lost souls to Jesus. In John 15 and verse 5, He that abideth in me and I in him, the same beareth much fruit. And this is a part of our spiritual exercise. And yet, in order to be meaningful 
each person must basically choose his own work. I believe that one of the worst mistakes that I've made in more than 35 years of full-time local work has been in trying to develop a program of work, persuading the elders to endorse it, and, and then expecting the members to line up like toy soldiers to participate in it, uh, by at least implying if you're going to be a faithful, active Christian, you'll want to be a part of this program. You must do this thing in this way. Now, some of those programs were very effective. Many of them were copied by others with good results, but a number of them were still basically flawed in that they did not allow or at least allowed little or no room for human initiative. And if 1 Corinthians chapter 12 means anything, when it compares the church to the members of the physical body, it is that Christians are different. They do not have the same talents and abilities. They do not have the same function in the church. And thus, all of our work programs must allow room for every member to choose his own place and to use his time and his abilities for God in the best way possible. And yet all must be active. Any failure in that will not only hurt the church, but it will rob us of the spiritual strength that comes only through meaningful participation. And thus, if you want to grow strong in the Lord, Never forget such passages as Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10. Whatsoever thou hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Or in Colossians 3 and verse 23, whatever you do, do it heartedly as to the Lord and not to men. But another requirement in regard to spiritual growth, is that we must stay away from the diseases that will destroy your spirituality. We've already mentioned some of the things that we must put off in becoming Christians. And so I do not need to reiterate them here, but I do want to emphasize the principle with all the power of my being. Because one can be tremendously strong and disease can make that person weak in a very brief period of time. Now, sin is the disease of the soul. Any participation in it will destroy your spiritual strength. Any meditation of it will endanger your security in Jesus. And so David prayed, in Psalms 19, verses 13 and 14, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent of the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Do you remember how vividly Isaiah describes sin in Isaiah 1 and verse 6 by saying that it is an open putrefying sore that will not heal. I saw a sign in a doctor's office in Arkansas several years ago that said simply to get well, you must quit doing what made you sick. And so our message is, you can never be cured of the disease of sin while you're practicing sin. Is it any wonder that many people have difficulty in being cured of this spiritual malady when they're not ready to completely quit the thing that made them sick in the first place. But when worldliness or materialism or the negative thinking of a moat hunting attitude creeps in, all possibility of spiritual development flies far away. It is no wonder then that the Bible urges us in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18, 
flee fornication. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12, flee youthful lusts. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Or in Colossians 3 verses 5 and 6, mortify or put to death, therefore, your members on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupience, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake cometh a wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Now notice that no feeble, half-hearted effort is going to get the job done. But we must run. We must flee. We must stay away from. We must abhor the evil that will destroy our spiritual strength in faith and commitment to Jesus. But my final urging in regard to spiritual growth that is simply that allow God to help you grow. Give him room to operate in your life. But stay so close to God that sin and evil cannot even come close. In Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not upon thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy steps. And so allow God to room to operate rightly in your life. Brother Claude Gild expressed it this way. He said, if we think of God as being distant, impersonal, then we're going to live at wayward and undedicated lives. But if we think of God as being very near, nearer than our hands and our feet, nearer than the very breath that we breathe, if we think of him as being very personal and loving, we're going to live dedicated, consecrated, and devoted lives. The Apostle Paul said something similar in Acts 17, 27 and 28. When he said, for we know he's not far from every one of us. In him we live and move and have our being. As certain of your poets have said, we are also his offspring. In order to be impressed today with both God's nearness and his willingness to help, we have only to walk through the valley of the Psalms. Uh, and read in Psalms 46 and verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Uh, in Psalms 55 and verse 22, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. Uh, in Psalms 57 and verse 1, in the shadow of thy wings will I take refuge until all of these calamities be overpassed. In Psalm 66 and verse 16, come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he's done for my soul. In Isaiah, or rather in Psalms 91 and verse 11, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. In Psalms 118 and verse 6, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? And then back in Psalms 34 and verse 14, Many are the affliction to the righteous, but the Lord will deliver him out of them all. And so God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, God is able to make all grace unto you abound, that you having all sufficiency in all things, that you might abound unto every good work. Or in Philippians 4 and verse 19, God, he said, will supply your every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so, if you want to grow spiritually strong in Jesus, then let God touch your life today. It was battered and scarred in the auctioneer, thought was scarcely worth his while. To spend much time with the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he cried, who will start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, and then two. Only two, two dollars, and who will make it three? Three dollars once and three dollars twice, and going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man 
came forward and picked up the bow. He wiped the dust from the old violin and tightened the loosened strings and played a melody pure and sweet as the caroling angel sings. That the music ceased and the auctioneer, with a voice now quiet and low, said, what am I bidding for the old violin? And who'll start the bidding for me? A thousand dollars. And who'll make it two? Two thousand. And who'll make it three? Three thousand once and three thousand twice. And, and going and gone, said he. And the people cheered. But some of them cried. We do not quite understand what changed its worth. Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand, that, and many a man with his life out of tune and battered and scarred by sin has been auctioned cheap by a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin, a mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. That he's going once, he's going twice. That he's going and he's almost gone. That but the foolish crowd never quite understand the the uh, the power or the the touch of a master's hand. That my friends, I suggest to you that God will help you grow. If only you'll trust in him, if you'll rely upon his uplifting power, you can become the full-grown, mature Christian that God would have you to be. The rules are very simple. Eat the right kind of food. Exercise yourself in good works. Stay away from the diseases of sin that will destroy your spirituality and rely upon God's help. As he said in Isaiah 41 and verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not di uh, dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness set with God's help every Christian can say I'm pressing on the upward way new heights I'm gaining every day my friends the way is now laid out before you. You can become the dedicated, committed Christian that you really want to be. But now, right now, is the time to begin. I want to thank you personally for coming so early to this service this morning. Thank you for listening so well. And may God help you and bless you as you grow strong in Him.